When, when I was just a little boy, one afternoon, my two sisters and I accompanied my mother for grocery shopping as she made the rounds. The last stop on our journey was a little uh, fresh vegetable and fruit store, and mom was kind of in a hurry. At that time, she drove a 1964 Volkswagen Beetle. And since we were running a little bit late, she said to me and my two sisters, I'm going to leave the windows down. You stay in the car. I'll run inside. So she's parked on the street in front of this little grocery stand. Of course, you would never, never do that today, but this was the 1960s, and so she left us in the car. While she was in that little grocery stand, we decided to occupy ourselves by playing like we were driving the Volkswagen. At one point, one of my sisters got the brilliant idea that she was going to shift the gear stick and apparently shifted it out of gear and into neutral. Mind you, we were parked on a hill. So the Volkswagen started to roll backwards. You've got the picture, right? Three little kids in a Volkswagen rolling backwards down a hill, screaming bloody murder, thinking to ourselves, this is it, we're going to die, when a, a quick-thinking woman who was walking past rushed up, thrust her arm in the window, and pulled the emergency brake. Thank God we were saved. But I will never forget that feeling for those few moments as we were rolling backwards, terrified and helpless. Oh my God, what's going to happen to us? How's this going to end? We're all going to die. I feel echoes of those feelings in this current coronavirus crisis. Helplessness and Fear. I mean, it's crazy out there. Earlier this week on Monday afternoon, I was in Walmart standing in line, a really long line. So to kill time, I pulled out my phone. David had just sent, a, had just, just texted a, a, a meme, a coronavirus meme that showed a, a, a woman talking to her doctor. The doctor says to her, unfortunately, you've tested positive for coronavirus. The woman says, that's not possible. I bought 200 rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> I was reading a, uh, a scientific article this past week that said that apparently the only living creature that is immune from coronavirus are ants. Because, you know, they have little antibodies. <laughs> Go ahead, groan at home. It's good for you. It feels familiar. You've experienced this before. These are such strange times that in our household, even our cats have begun to practice social distancing. See, there they are. Opposite ends of the couch, a perfect six feet apart, it's crazy out there. So this past week, in all seriousness, I've been asking God, what do you want to say to us? The congregation of Life Journey Church, in a time like this, God, what's your word for us? And in my spirit, the answer came, Loud and clear, I heard God saying to me, you say to them, we will not be victims. We will not be victims. Satan would like nothing more in a time like this than to convince us that we're helpless and to paralyze us in fear. I sensed God's spirit saying to my spirit, no life journey church is not going to do that. So I said, God, what does that mean? What does it look like to not be victims 
in a time like this. And God laid on my heart three declarative statements, three instructions, three exhortations, if you will, that I believe I'm supposed to share with you today. So let's say a prayer, and we're going to dive in. God, we need to hear your voice more clearly now than ever before. So right now, in this moment, we pause. We quiet ourselves. We feel our connection to each other, though we're online, separated by miles. We feel our connection to each other. We are one in the spirit, the mystical communion of the saints. And as we share this virtual worship experience, we are ready to hear what your spirit wants to say to us today. Speak, Lord, we're listening. Give us what we need. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. The earliest Christians in that first Jerusalem church faced a crisis. Times were hard. Persecution and isolation were real. As a result, according to today's scripture passage, Acts chapter 6, some of the most vulnerable members of that first Jerusalem church began to experience food scarcity. We're told in today's <clears throat> scripture passage that there were two kinds of people in that first Jerusalem church. The first category are referred to as the Hebrews. That is a reference to Jewish Christians in that first church who had lived their entire lives in Jerusalem and spoke Aramaic as their primary language. The other group that is referred to in our scripture passage that inhabited that first Christian church are referred to as the Hellenists. Those are Jewish Christians who had lived a part of their life outside of Jerusalem whose primary language was Greek. All of the power positions in that first Jerusalem church were occupied by Hebrews, because of that dynamic and cultural and linguistic barriers, the most vulnerable among the Hellenists began to be neglected and experience food shortages. The most vulnerable among the Hellenists were their elder women, the widows who in that time and culture had few, if any, means to support themselves. And so many of the Hellenist widows, were told, were starting to experience hunger. Can you imagine what it would feel like not to know where you're going to get your next meal. And imagine the gratitude you would feel if God sent someone to your rescue. But a strange thing happens when we experience scarcity. Our primitive primal psyche kicks in and we feel compelled above all else, to protect ourselves, to turn inward. If I have to knock you over to get what I need, so be it. It's, it, it's kind of like that, uh, that old story about two campers who were in the woods and, and 50 feet ahead of them on the trail, they see a big black bear. The first camper pulls off his backpack, begins riding through it, pulls out a pair of sneakers and is, is furiously trying to get his sneakers on. The second camper says to the first camper, there's no point, we won't be able to outrun the bear. The first camper says to the second, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. That's the primitive, primal mentality that tends to kick in when we find ourselves in times of shortage and scarcity. Satan would like nothing better than to get each one of us to kick in to that 
mentality. I'll get and do what I need for myself, even if it's to the detriment of others. But Jesus comes along and calls us to something higher. In his book, The Irresistible Revolution, Shane Claiborne tells about a time he was ministering to the homeless on the streets of Philadelphia. A food distribution van pulled up with these boxed, prepackaged, simple meals that they were handing out. The homeless lined up, but before long, it began to be apparent that the number of homeless greatly outstripped the available boxes of food. So the line, he said, began to break down. People started pushing and shoving, tussling. Before long, he says, there was an all-out fight. He says, I watched as this young home homeless woman furiously fought with the others to finally secure one of those boxes of food. As things settled down, Shane walked up to that young woman and said to her, that box of food, was, was it worth the fight? Oh, yes, she said. But she said, I didn't get this for me. I'm going to take it around the corner to an elderly homeless woman who's too feeble to fight for herself. Shane says, it's in that moment that I realized that I was in the presence of Jesus. The Spirit of Christ working through this young homeless woman, the sacrificial, selfless spirit of Jesus Christ. That's beautiful. I want to be more like that young homeless woman. I want to have that spirit in me. Ten days ago, I was communicating with someone in our congregation. She told me that that. She makes a living by uh, pet sitting for people who are on travel, but now that no one is traveling, she said, I'm so afraid. I don't know how I'm going to meet next month's rent, and I don't know how I'll meet my basic food needs. It weighs heavy on my heart that in the months ahead, there may be some people in our congregation, Life Journey Church, who begin experiencing what those Hellenist widows in that first Christian church were experiencing, that some of our people may not know where their next meal is going to come from. A week ago Friday, someone else in, my, in our congregation contacted me. It was an email, just two lines in the email. She said, do you know of anyone in our church who is self-quarantined? I would be happy to bring them groceries if needed. And that's when it hit me. I thought to myself, that's it. <laughs> we can do that. We should do that. We can do in our time what the Christians in that first Jerusalem church did <clears throat> in their time. Because as we continue reading through our passage of scripture, Acts chapter 6, it tells us that when it came to the attention of the apostles, the leaders of that first Jerusalem church, that the Hellenist widows were experiencing food scarcity, the apostles didn't say, oh, what, concern of that is, what concern is that to us? The apostles didn't say, well, I hope the government comes through for them, even though we would hope the government would come through. No, those first Jerusalem Christians said, if anybody among us doesn't have food. That's our problem. And the apostles appointed church history's first ever ministry team. A group of volunteers in that Jerusalem church that were responsible for making sure that food was distributed to the Hellenist widows. And because of what that ministry team did, the very end of our passage of Scripture today tells us, Acts 6, 7, the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and even a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Because whenever there is a group of people who dare to live the values of Jesus, that's just so beautiful that other people see that and feel drawn to the faith. I want our church to be like that. And I know you want our church to be like that as well. We can be 
like that. The great dragon that we call coronavirus would like nothing better than to inspire in us a sense of helplessness and fear that causes us to turn inward on ourselves, to hunker down, to be victims. I say, instead, let's do what Jesus would do. Let's do what those first Christians in that first Jerusalem church did. I am inviting every one of us today to resolve together. And this is the first of the three declarative statements, the three exhortations that God laid on my heart. I'm inviting all of us, wherever we are, watching from wherever we are, to join in unison and to agree with one another that during this time of coronavirus crisis, we're going to have each other's back. No one in this congregation will go without food because we will not be victims. Wherever you are at home watching this, say it with me. We will not be victims. So here's what we're going to do. This week, we're going to form a brand new ministry team. Most of our ministry teams at Life Journey right now are on hiatus because of coronavirus. We need something to do <laughs> other than just sit on the couch at home and watch the news loop and loop until we're nauseous or watch our favorite uh, reruns from TV days of yore. We need something positive to do that will get us out of that victim, helpless headspace. So we're going to form a ministry team, a brand new ministry team. Here's the plan. There will be people in our congregation who in the months ahead will contract coronavirus, but in a mild enough form that they'll have to shelter at home instead of going to the hospital. They may or may not have someone who can go and get groceries for them. They may or may not be able to afford groceries at that point. There are bound to be some in our congregation in the months ahead who will be exposed to those with coronavirus and have to uh, self-quarantine. They may or may not have someone who can go and get groceries for them. They may or may not be able to afford those groceries. There are elderly people in our congregation who should not be out grocery shopping in a time like this. They may or may not be able to afford those groceries, but they definitely need someone to get those groceries for them. And there will be people in our congregation who are laid off for their, from their jobs. And they may need critical bridge assistance before government assistance kicks in. They may not be able to afford their groceries. So, let's form a ministry team. Let's call it, the, let's call it Operation Loaves and Fishes. Remember the gospel story we talked about last week where Jesus performed a miracle taking five loaves of bread and two fish and multiplying them and feeding a crowd of more than 5,000 people and having leftovers to boot? My prayer is that God will reenact in and through us in our time right here at Life Journey a miracle of sufficiency. There will be two uh, groups that comprise Operation Loaves and Fishes. The first group of volunteers, let's call them providers. I like that name. God is our provider. And Ephesians 5.1 says, be ye imitators of God as dear children. So we are called to be providers. Providers are the volunteers who, even in this time of crisis, will have enough financial means when they're at the grocery store, to occasionally purchase an extra bag or two of food. Don't buy those bags yet. We'll tell you later this week what to put in those bags. The other group of people that comprise Operation Loaves and Fishes will be the deliverers. I like that word too. Jesus is our deliverer, and we are called to be Jesus to people in the world. Deliverers are the folks who will come to the church, get those bags of groceries, and deliver them to the door of those who are in need. You won't go inside. 
You'll knock on the door, set the groceries down, stand six feet back. When the person comes to the door, you will greet them with a virtual hug from six feet away. You will say words of blessing, and you will see them tear up (laughs) out of overwhelming gratitude that in this time of crisis, their church family had their back. We need providers, and we need deliverers. If you are feeling called to be part of this, we've got a, an online response form that you can fill out today. You just go to the link that I just put on the screen, lifejourney.church backslash loaves and fishes. And there you can indicate whether you're feeling called to be a provider or a deliverer or some combination of both. Later this week, we will send you more information, at which point you can make the final decision whether you're able to participate in this. And by the way, it's not just our congregation who's going to be in need. And Jesus is not just calling us to take care of ourselves. I believe there will be such a miracle of sufficiency that we'll also be able to share with our neighbors. You have people that live next door to you that may need help in this time of crisis. And there will definitely be people in houses in the neighborhoods around this church who will be experiencing food scarcity. I believe there's going to be so much overflowing generosity that we're going to be able to share not just among ourselves, but with those who've not yet made contact with our church. As you're hearing this, there may be some who say, you know, I I, I can't go to the grocery store and shop, but I'd sure love to make a financial donation to this. If so, you can go on to the church website, to the donation page, and you'll see a little box there you can check off that designates a gift toward Operation Loaves and Fishes. But a word of caution, please. Before you do that, (laughs) I want you to remember that, that last Sunday, because we can't collect a physical offering, the amount that we normally would have collected in the offering plate last Sunday, we collected barely half that last Sunday. And so if that trend were to continue, it would be really challenging for our church. And if there's no church, there'll be no food program. And so my plea to those of us who are regular givers is that if you are able during this time of crisis, please Give priority to your regular giving. And then if you feel led and you're able to give over and above that to loaves and fishes, that's great. If we all pull together, if we all do what we can, there will be more than enough. And we will experience our own modern miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Now, I've gone and spent almost all my time on one of three declarative statements God gave me to share with you quickly now. Let me accelerate. Let me share with you the other two declarative statements. What does it look like for us, Life Journey Church, to to not be victims in this crisis? Number one, it means we'll have each other's backs. No one in this congregation is going to go without food and Number two, it means we will stay connected to each other during this time of crisis. Have you ever seen uh, the animated uh, movie Wally? If so, you know that it, it tells the story of a robot named Wally who has been cleaning up trash for 700 years on an abandoned planet Earth. You get the impression that Wally is the last functioning robot left on the planet. He's all alone. In one scene, after a long day of cleaning trash, he comes home. His home is this warehouse-like structure where he houses his many different collections. As he's working during the day, collecting, sorting through trash, when he sees something interesting, he'll pull it out, set it aside, and take it home and add it to his collection. 
And so in this particular scene, as he comes home at the end of a long day, he's got this beat up old uh, VCR tape of the musical Hello Dolly that he pops into his VCR and TV and it starts playing in the background as he sorts through the other items of interest that he brought home with him that day. A silver hubcap, a Rubik's Cube, a Zippo lighter, and a spork. He doesn't know whether to put the spork in his fork collection or in his spoon collection. But then, what's happening on the TV screen draws his attention. A man and a woman are, are walking through the park in Hello, Dolly. It's obviously a romantic moment, and they are singing to each other. It only took a moment to be loved a whole life long. Wally is moved. He pushes the record button on his chest. He watches as the couple make their way through the park holding hands. He reaches out his hand and touches it with his other hand as if he's trying to imagine what it would feel like to hold somebody's hand. Later, Wally goes outside. He looks up at the starry sky. He presses the replay button on his chest as the man and the woman sing to each other, and that is all that love's about. And we'll recall when time runs out that it only takes a moment to be loved a whole life long. Wally sighs deeply. Then he goes back inside, feeds a Twinkie to his pet cockroach, crawls in bed, curls up, and rocks himself to sleep. A poignant reminder of how desperately we all need companionship. It's why the Bible says in Genesis 2, 24, it is not good for the human to be alone. It's why Hebrews 10, 25 says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together next to food. The thing that we humans most desperately need is each other. And so, in this time of crisis, I'm inviting each one of us to resolve in our hearts that we are going to stay connected, that no one in our congregation is going to be alone. We are family. Oh, I feel a song coming on. <laughs> Somebody stop me. We are family. Da, 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 da. I got all my sisters with me. Da, 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 da. We are family. Get up, everybody, and sing. I'm sorry you had to see that. <laughs> but hopefully you will now remember it. We are a church family. We need each other now. You need us. Or you may need us. <laughs> and we need you. More than ever before. This could be our finest hour. Or it could be our worst hour. Life Journey Church, it's going to be our finest hour. We're going to stay connected. And here's how we're going to do it. It all starts with what we are experiencing right now, 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, Facebook Live worship together. Thank you, thank you, all of you who are out there faithfully connecting today. It means the world to all of us that we, it's not the same as being in the same room, but it's still a beautiful, mystical, wonderful thing to all be together at the same time, worshiping, reflecting, connecting to God and each other. I'm asking each one of us to make a religious personal commitment <laughs> to being present 11 o'clock, Facebook Live, on Sunday mornings. By the way, did you know that our Facebook Live worship experience last week, we had 1,408 engagements. 
Think about that. That's more people than we would have ever impacted if we had our two regular worship services. Wouldn't it be strange if during this time of exile and dispersion, wouldn't it be strange if God ended up using us to touch, bless, and help more people than ever before in the history of our church? God works in mysterious ways. It was when those first Christians were forced by persecution to disperse that Christianity really took off. God can take tragedies and turn them into something powerful. We can be part of that, so let's stay connected. Be sure to register your presence with us today. So uh, Spencer has put in the comment section of the Facebook page uh, a link that you can go to to register if you're out there watching. Register your presence. If you're brand new, please register with us, and, and, and we loved. What a wonderful time to welcome you into our Life Journey Church community. So go in and register. And then by seeing who registers, our pastors, by process of elimination, can figure out who's not connected, and we can then reach out to them. So by you registering today, you're helping us to figure out who isn't connected and who needs a special call to invite them into this connection. By the way, today also, we're live streaming on Vimeo and on YouTube. So on three different platforms, thanks to the technical wizardry of our uh, operations minister, uh, Spencer James. So that means we're reaching even more people, uh, even people who can't be on Facebook Live. So it all begins with what we do here together on Sunday morning, but there are important additional options for staying connected. As Pastor David mentioned, virtually all of our Oasis groups are still meeting, not in person, but on the Zoom platform. You can, if you have a camera with your computer or your phone, you can live video, audio chat, and see all the folks in your Oasis group on the screen it's almost like being in the same room. And if you're not technically savvy, you can dial in on your phone and get an audio connection to the Vimeo room, and you can hear your Oasis friends, and they'll be able to hear your voice. So all of us can stay connected through our Oasis groups. The Oasis group I'm most closely connected to, the West Side Oasis, had 16 people in their Vimeo room this last week because we need each other in times like these. If you've not been connected to an Oasis group so far, now's a beautiful time to connect. Choose any one of our Oasis groups to find the Oasis groups and how to connect through Zoom. You go to our, the homepage of our church website, click on the red uh, alert banner at the top, the coronavirus alert. That will take you to a page where you click on Oasis groups, and it will give you specific instructions for how you dial in or connect through your computer or phone. So be part of our Oasis groups. Another additional option, Pastor David mentioned, 7 o'clock this Wednesday, our deacons will begin hosting a live uh, a prayer meeting on Zoom. Another option, we have our dinner church continuing on uh, Thursday nights at 7. I don't know how you have dinner together virtually on the Zoom platform. I guess you all prepare your meal, and while you're there chatting with each other, you, you have your own meal, and you share fellowship with one another. Another option is for families with children. Our Life Journey Facebook Families page Pastor Chris and Phoenix are putting all kinds of spiritual and other resources on there so that as your kids are at home and going a little nuts and maybe driving you a little nuts, there are arts and crafts and spiritual stories. Every night on that page, you'll find a bedtime story for your children. Isn't that cool? So parents, take advantage of that resource and the final option I'll mention is Pastor Chris has also started a brand new parents support group on Zoom at 9 o'clock on Wednesday nights after you put the kids to bed, if you need to talk to some other adults, if you need to compare, want to compare notes on how things are going and share ideas for, for how to help your family get through this, whether you're part of Life Journey Church or brand new online, you are welcome to participate in that. All of those options that I've mentioned land on our church homepage, lifejourney.church. Scroll down to headline news, and you'll find brief articles that give you the Zoom instructions for connecting to all these things. Because now, more than ever, it is critical 
that we stay connected to one another. Let's resolve we're going to do that. Finally, the last declarative statement that I believe God has laid on my heart to share with us today, and this may be the most important. I hope you make it your mantra, your personal mantra, as you move forward through this. The final declarative statement, how do we not be victims in this time? We will face our fears and we will face them down. I love what uh, Nelson Mandela once said about fear. Reflecting on his decades as a political prisoner, Nelson Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. I get such relief from that because I think sometimes we tend to think that courage means I don't feel fear, but fear is a natural human emotion. Fear is often a helpful human emotion. When we have reasonable fears, we should take reasonable precautions. But we must not dwell in our fear. We must not get stuck there. We must not let our fear control us. As you move forward through this crisis, do not let fear suck the beauty out of your daily life. There is so much beauty that lies ahead of you in the days ahead, even in the midst of this crisis. Don't let go of that. Don't let fear rob you of that. Let me close with this. When I was 12 years old, my family was planning a trip to Kings Island, the amusement park. This was back in the day when uh, it was smaller than it is now. <clears throat> I had invited my best friend at the time, Mike Green, to accompany us on this outing. But I said to him, if he was going to accompany me on the outing with my family, he would have to agree that we were not going to ride the roller coaster at Kings Island. It had only one roller coaster at the time, the racer. Mike loved roller coasters. I was deathly afraid of them. I know it will surprise you, but I was something of a wimp as a child. So I said to Mike, if you go to Kings Island with me, no roller coasters. He wanted to go, so he agreed. But as soon as we got there, he began pressuring me to get on the racer. Mike, I said we agreed, and I dragged him into Hanna-Barbera land, and we got on the Scooby-Doo ride, which is this little floaty boat that floats along in this little channel of water as Hanna-Barbera cartoon characters sing lullabies to you. That was about my speed. But as soon as we were off the Scooby-Doo ride, Mike was at it again. I finally was shamed into relenting. We sat down in the roller coaster and the safety bar locked down in front of us. I gripped it tightly with white knuckles and thought to myself, we're going to die. What's going to happen? How's this going to end? And then the roller coaster rolled out of the station and started chugging up that first monumental hill. Why do roller coasters have to chug and jerk like that? Because as it was chugging and jerking like that, I was having flashbacks to the Volkswagen. Oh no, we're gonna roll backwards down this hill. It scared me to death. I gripped the bar with all my might. We finally reached the crest of that monumental hill. We tipped forward. I looked down. It looked like it was straight down. Some people were crazy enough to have their hands in the air. We went over the top and down. It was the most exhilarating thing. I have ever, I had ever experienced. I loved it. By the time we got to the third hill, I was throwing my hands up in the air. When we rolled back into the station and stopped, I looked at Mike and said, let's do that again and again and again. I am so glad that on that day, I faced my fears and faced them down. Otherwise, I would have missed the incredible beauty of that day. How about you? 
These are scary times. It would be really tempting to grab the safety bar in front of us, white knuckle tight, close our eyes and say, I'm not opening my eyes until this is over. Satan would like nothing better than for us to hunker down, turn inward, and become victims. What would happen if we released our grip and by faith declared in the words of Psalm 118.24, this is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Jeff, you may say, I'd love to be able to do that and really mean that, but how do I do that? By focusing on the good that is happening. That doesn't mean live in denial. There's plenty of bad happening. We should take reasonable precautions against it. But don't get stuck there. Don't let it control you. Each time you find yourself dwelling on a negative thought or fear, consciously redirect your thoughts to something that you are thankful for, something wonderful and positive that is happening in the here and now. Redirect your brain as many times as you have, have to until you retrain your brain because maybe that's what God is trying to teach you. One of the things God is trying to teach you in this crisis, that you are greater than your circumstances. So, seize the opportunities that are out there to engage in acts of service and deeds of kindness. Make sure you are celebrating our worship time together. Love your oasis group. Enjoy and be with your family in this time. Take in the wonder of nature that is all around us. Savor the delicious food that God gives you each day. Laugh uproariously. Sing defiantly. Share generously. Because you are not a victim. We're going to get through this together. And Life Journey Church is going to come out the other side of this stronger than ever, mark my word. And you personally can grow stronger through this. Because we will face our fears. And we will face them down. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Reframe. Everybody out there watching today, wherever you are, say it aloud with me right now. We will not be victims. One more time, say it aloud. We will not be victims. Amen. Thanks be to God.